Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is the season premiere of City Talk. He manages $178.6 billion in state pension funds. He audits the spending of all state agencies and local government. He reviews the New York State and New York City budget. He must approve all state contracts. He was elected to serve his third term in November 2014, the highest vote getter in the state. He signs my check and is a frequent guest here on City Talk. No connection. <laughs> He's Thomas DiNapoli, the controller of the state of New York. He's here to talk politics, the governor, state senate election, Hillary Trump, and he's here to talk issues, public corruptions, corporate spending, political spending, and more. Mr. DiNapoli was named controller in February 2007 and was elected to the position in November 2010 and again in 2014. Previously, he served in the Assembly for 20 years, representing the 16th Assembly District in northwest Nassau County. Good to have you back, Mr. Controller. Honored to be part of the season premiere with you, Doug. And it is good to be back after a, a year and a half. Uh, let's start with some good and timely news. And it's back. Lower Manhattan is back. Yeah, yeah. Your... Uh, transformation of Manhattan's economy is really significant. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. what do you see here? Well, I, you you summed it up right. I mean, it, it's back after the the tragedy of 9/11. Uh, we just had that commemoration, uh, and our report, and we do these reports on different neighborhoods in, in New York. Uh, actually went back to 2000, so it's considering the, the dot-com bubble burst and that recession, the Great Recession back in 08 and 09, and of course what happened on 9-11-2001. And, and, and the changes are, are significant. You've seen a doubling of the population. I mean, that's incredible. What had been a, you know, a, a business district and, and, and sleepy after 5 o'clock, now you got baby carriages and people walking I dogs. I worked and, in yeah. City Hall in 79. Yeah. That was yeah. a ghost town. It was town. ghost town, yeah. That, it's, it's changed back. And my office is down there now. We're downtown on yep. Maiden Lane. So yep. we, we, we see it. You're, you're seeing uh, uh, job growth. So you, you're at the highest point of employment, 228,000 jobs, private sector jobs, highest since 9-11. You're seeing a transformation of that neighborhood in terms of the population growth. Com what had been commercial buildings turned into residential. Yep. And new, and new office space coming online as well. So and retail space. And retail space. And, the, and that's the key thing, the diversification yep. of the economy. Yep, yep. You know, the finance industry, not quite, but, but half as many jobs, as, you know, yes. as they were before. Significant. But now you're seeing the other sectors really picking up. So because of the residential nature of the neighborhood now, personal services, you're seeing the restaurants and the retail shops. And the and libraries. The dry, cle dry cleaners, yeah. And the libraries. And, and um, you're seeing tourism. Huge impact. I mean, yeah. And I see it whenever I go out to walk out for lunch. You know, U.S. tourists, tourists from overseas, yep. everybody wants to, to go see the, obviously, the World Trade Center site. They want to see Federal Hall. They yep. want to see the Stock Exchange. So, you, you know, you, the leisure hospitality, the number of hotels that are being developed Incredible. down there. Incredible. You know, so the economy is remaking itself, but you're talking about a very vibrant area. It doesn't mean there aren't challenges. You have... Was, I think th I think our report is three times as many kids, children as there were before. Yeah, and schools. So schools, oh, overcrowding man. is an issue. Terrible. And having to keep up with that. So, you know. High really, schools, middle schools. Yeah, the whole gamut. The whole gamut. Yeah. The whole gamut. So, yeah, you, what you really see is a combination of, of the business sector, obviously labor, the, uh, uh, the government sector, uh, and then the not-for-profits. Really coming together in a coordinated way. You've got the wonderful Downtown Alliance. That Jessica Lappin heads right now. You know, Gail Brewer was at our press conference when we announced the report, and she's such a dynamic yeah, president. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. So there's a lot of focus on Lower Manhattan. Uh, a lot of jobs are there that benefit the city and the state. Uh, the resilience of the community is really quite something. So if the terrorists thought they were going to 
devastate us and put New York down with 9-11, just the opposite has happened. And, and there's an, an aesthetic transformation in the area mm. as well. That, mm. That's really important. The transportation hubs. The, Very important. Is, yeah. is incredible. Well, you know, if you're going to have a vibrant economy, not just in lower Manhattan, you have to have the transportation. So yeah. now that, you know, the jobs are growing again, the, the access, you know, for the Jersey commuters, for people within the city, for people coming from Long Island, you know, it really... It really is quite remarkable, and, and we need to keep that progress moving forward. Okay. Um, remarkable resurgence. Let's talk some politics. Really? You want to talk yeah, politics? Yeah, politics. Okay. Right. okay. Maybe, maybe the whole <laughs> show. What's up with the governor? Why does he react the way he does to all, you know, criticism? But he's got a particular animus toward you. Why? I thought you were about Governor Christie for a minute there. I didn't know where you were going. I guess you're talking about the New York governor. Well, you know, look. Uh, Come on. There is, a, there, is, there, is a, there is a very clear role of independence for the controller and an oversight role that, by definition... It's going to create you're, institutional you're, is, conflict. Is, is, the, the tension is there. It was set up to be yes. a tense relationship. Okay. So, but. you know, we're going to do our job our way, and, and some, whether it's the governor or a state agency or sometimes a state legislature or a local government, they're not going to like it, but we, that's what we're expected to do. It, we don't take gratuitous shots. I always have to remind people, when we put out an audit, you know, and that was the focus of some of the, the back and forth, the auditors do the I don't sit there and do the audit, you know. Uh, we have civil service people that are trained as auditors. They have to adhere to professional standards. Whatever their audit produces, as long as I have confidence in the men and women who work in our, in our office, I'm going to back them up. They're not political appointees. Many of them were there before I got there, and many of them tell me they'll be there after I'm gone. They're there to do their job in the right way. And that's where the level of accountability and transparency that too often is lacking in government today, it, that's where our office plays a key role, and we're not going to shirk our responsibility. Talk about startup. You issue an audit, and the governor responds by saying that you're wrong, dead wrong, and then he throws in, you should educate yourself. It's only an opinion. Well, he, he's seeking to undermine your authority. Yeah. And he does that with all the potential yeah. opponents. Yeah. Well, it's really to challenge our credibility, right? And so, you know, startup was an early audit, and then we had the Excelsior program well, and, I mean, and, and recharge. So, you know, I said, I said a while ago, Everybody's concerned about the economy. Everybody's concerned about jobs. You know, we put out a report about the upstate economy. And many I, we'll talk about yeah. that. So I said, you know, we've, we've, we've put a lot of money through existing programs and new programs into economic development. It's a good time now that we're in more of a recovery mode. Let's take a look. What is the return on the investment of those taxpayer dollars? So we've been doing more audits in this area. Uh, the fact that we had criticisms, they really were suggestions on how to make these programs work. You could have a big debate. You could do a show on whether or not we should be spending all this money. On oh, right, right. You know? But that's, that's not for me. That's for the government legislature to work out. But when you have the programs, we're going to evaluate based on the goals and what you hope to achieve. How are you doing? Yeah. And then we're going to make recommendations where we think you're falling short. And, and that's what we did. So you, the fact that perhaps some people didn't like that, to attack then the credibility of the audit work, yeah. that to me made no sense because people could read the audit. They can right. read the response. We read right. the response as well. And I think, in fact, you know, most people that did evaluate it said, okay, the controls office is making some valid points. And again, it gets back to the fact there was some suggestion that the audits represented a predetermined opinion that I directed was going to... Believe me, I don't tell my auditors how to audit. And, and, and they, they call as they see it. Look, we put out an audit, uh, you know, er, earlier in September, uh, a good news audit on general services is doing a new... Uh, a service disabled veterans yep. program and a, a good initiative by the yep. governor yep. and it was yep. a positive one yep. we said they got yep. a, did it get nope. much press attention nope. did anybody say oh nope. wonderful job no nope. you know, but nope. unfortunately or fortunately the reality is when when there are moments where you have to suggest improvements that's what gets the attention so it, you know th and and the attention of the governor and the anger of the governor and Okay. Now, but, but let, me, let, let me tell you. This. Go ahead. When I when I early on I became controller, I had a very nice visit from Arthur Levitt Jr. Yes. Ar the yes. Arthur Levitt was like the modern yes. controller, right? Yes. He was in for since uh, what fifty four to seventy eight. He was the controller, legend, and his son, you know, that became the yes. SEC chairman. Yes. And he says, I just wanted to say one thing. He said, you know, my father always said 
that if you're doing audits and there is no criticism of your audits, it means you're not doing your job. Yes, yes. And that always stuck yes. with me, is that there are times yes. we just have to call it as we see it and may make some folks uncomfortable, but our responsibility is to the taxpayers and the people of New York. It is not to any other interest. And we're going to call it as we see it. I, I hate to, to keep pressing this, but when he says that you have to get educated, personally it doesn't, it bounces off you? You know, the advantage of uh, having been around a while is that, you know, a lot of things have been said over the years. And, uh, yeah, okay. And, and the, look, I, edu I educated myself by reading the audit. Yeah, yeah. I read the audit. Yeah, I educated yeah, myself. Yeah. There was no reason for me not to stand behind it. And yeah. uh, the audit speaks for itself. Yeah, but, okay. You've done the audits, uh, particularly the startup audit with, you know, 408 jobs, 50 million. Well, but on the 408 jobs, that was their own report. Yeah. Our that's, audit that's was true. on the advertising right. Right. and how the much money was spent and, and, yes. and lack. Yes. Of uh, yes. valid measurements, the criticism on startup for the for the uh, the paucity of jobs created that was their own report. Yeah, that no, that's true. Put out right before that's the Fourth of July holiday. That, that's on the right, Fridays. right. <laughs> and you know, okay. Was, and then the Excelsior audit yeah. was. I mean, Glenn Blaine of the, the Daily News uh, described it as blistering, and the headline reads: "State controller rips Cuomo." Over Excelsior job. No wonder the governor gets angry. Well, but you know, but look, Doug, and uh, you can appreciate this. We don't write the headlines. We don't write the articles. Right. Know, so I don't. Right. You know, right. If you read the press, if you read the audit, it didn't rip anybody. No, it you didn't. Know, it's, it's, it that's didn't. not what we do. Okay. You know. So we, but, but, but we call it clearly. You know, others can can make whatever judgments they want. Okay. To make. Let's do, let's turn to my favorite subject: Albany dysfunction. Mm. Is it better or worse with? Hasty and Flanagan, has it made no difference? What's the, how different from Shelley and Skelos? And, and, and differences in operation well, and output? You know, it's an interesting question. I mean, they're, they're obviously they're, very, they're different people, different personalities. I, w I uh, serve with Carl Hasty, and uh, I, he's very smart, and he's a low key guy, but is very on top of, of the details of being a speaker. And I think he very much. Um, understands the frustration that many members have felt for a long time about being closed out. When I talk to, to people in the assembly these days, they feel a renewed sense of being involved in decision making that they hadn't felt for a long period of time. And I think that will be helpful. John Flanagan and I actually were elected to the assembly in the same year. No. Yeah, same year. Uh, so we served together and I, I've seen his, you know, uh, seen a move from the assembly to the Senate and become Senate majority. He's a very fine person. Um, He's got a tough job. He's got a very thin majority in a state that's becoming very different. Yeah. But he's, he's, a, he's a good person. So, so, you know, look, the frustration with, with the previous speaker and the previous uh, majority leader, you know, when you, when you saw what happened with the trials, this, this, this notion of, of monetizing your office, I think is how Pre Parara yep. put it. You yep. know, in, in one case, you know, for, for yourself, in another case for, for a child. I mean, I think, I think that's where there's a lot about politics that, 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 that people put up with, even if they're not pleased with it. But when it looks like people are simply enriching themselves, uh, perhaps at the expense of good government, that's something they can't stand for. So I, I, I do think in terms of having to do more on uh, the disclosure side, limiting outside income, which caused some of these problems, or eliminate, I'm not necessarily sure that you have to eliminate all of it, but um, I mean, when I was in the assembly, I, I once in a while was an adjunct professor. You know, it wasn't bad for me to be doing a gut, right. you know, and for the $2,000, and was that, to me, that's not, you know, the same as, you know, hundreds of thousands Thousand because dollars. you got a law practice. So, but the congressional model, we have some kind of a limit. And campaign finance reform, you know, that's the big, that is still the big issue that has not been dealt with. There's too much money, too much, too much contribution. I mean, you could, you, one person can give over $60,000 to me running for control. It's crazy. Yeah, but How does that not, in some ways, undermine the total? Oh, yeah. System? But, I mean, it's a complex set of rules yes. at the state, the yes. federal. Yes. There's so much gray area right, and right. loopholes. Loopholes. Oh, and and every time you think you're, you're, you're closing something off, they figure out another way to get to it. So, so Preet isn't going after the legislature. He's going after well, the business developers, uh, Buffalo Bison, and some of the uh, governor's executive Buffalo staff. I dub Buffalo. But, but the Bisons are a good yeah, team. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, 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 well, look, but what he did in terms of the legislative, I mean, you know, no, I, he sent a very strong message. And I think people view him very much as a hero for not being afraid about trying to clean things up. 
Uh, and I give him credit for that. And his, his work continues. So we'll see what we'll say. We'll see what the current investigation. Yeah, but I, I, it, it seems as if his investigation is just spreading. You know, from uh, the legislative leaders to the executive branch to business connections. It's and 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 he finds corruption wherever he goes. It's systemic. Well, but let's see. I mean, you know, yeah. he's investigating. Yeah. Right? Okay. He's following the okay. money, as they say, okay. and we'll see where it goes. Okay. Yeah. State Senate. Yeah. It's. 31 to 31 to 1, and the uh, Democrat caucuses with the Republicans, Felder, right. right. and the five members of the Independent Democratic Conference yeah. sort of make a deal with, what do, you, what do you see in November? November, the day after the election, has that retained Republican or a combination or the Dem take over? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's always problematic to predict, but my, yes. my gut feeling is that you will see a clear Democratic majority. And then the next question will be, <clears throat> what happens to, to Senator Felder? What happens to the, to the Independent Democratic you know, uh, Conference? And that's, that, that's the big question mark. We just don't know what will happen. I, I, I don't know that there'll be so many seats that those votes won't, won't matter. I suspect they will matter. But I do think when you look at the map... It, it's it's this maybe one Democratic seat now that might be in jeopardy, but there are Ooh, several Pen, Republicans. Pen, oh, yeah, the Pen, 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 he's not running again. Uh, and so you have a couple on Long Island that very are competitive. Uh, very competitive. Very competitive. Well, Long, well Island's, Kaminsky, Long Island's been changing. Kaminsky won. Where I live, Senator Martins is not running again. He's running for Congress. Yes. And that, that seat was Democratic a couple of years ago. Right. Craig Johnson had it. So I think that could very easily be a pickup for Democrats. You've got some other competitive races on Long Island. Hudson Valley, you've got some competitive sure. races. So, so, you know, I think there are more Republican seats that are in jeopardy than there are Democratic ones. And, and my guess is, you know, the predictions are no matter what's happening, New York will vote Democratic, that that should help the Democratic ticket. But how they coalesce after that, and I think it's, well, I'm a Democrat. I think people should be in a party, be in a party caucus. Whatever your internal differences are or battles over leadership, you fight them out, you come together, and you stick together. So my preference, obviously, would be for the Democrats, right. all of them, come together and have a Democrat heading your, your leadership team. And Andrea Stewart-Cousins is a great person. She's okay. a wonderful senator. She, she'd be a great Senate Majority Leader. Okay. Let's go to uh, another report that, that your office did recently, August 26th, and it was the Upstate Jobs Report. Yeah. And I found it very interesting because my county and my uh, uh, region of the country is faring the worst, the southern, southern the tier. tier. Yeah. So why, yeah. don't, why don't you... Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 well, it, it's the challenge. We, 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 we brag about, rightfully so, you know, growing back with 750,000 jobs since the, the recession ended. Private sector job growth, very significant. Government sector, certainly smaller than it was, but uh, in some communities now they're starting to hire again. When you drill down on those numbers, though, you know, something like 90% of the new jobs have been created in the five boroughs of New York City and Long Island, mm -hmm. Nassau and Suffolk County. So when you get north of the city, you see a very mixed picture. And yes, there are some parts of, of upstate New York that have been doing it. The Capital Region yep. you know, has been doing better. The Finger Lakes, Rochester area. Yep. Western New York, you mentioned the Buffalo Billion yep. before. Well, obviously, it's been a big focus yep. there. But you, know, you get to the Southern Tier, you get to the Mohawk Valley, you get to Central New York, get to North Country, and, and you, have, you have communities there, that, some of which have fewer jobs, say, than they did five, six years ago. Oh, yeah. And, and no sense that it's about to, you know, to move Absolutely forward. Absolutely not. So, that's our challenge. The challenge, too, obviously, downstate is that some of the new jobs don't pay as much as the jobs they replaced. The finance sector is smaller than it was. Yeah. But, but the real challenge for us in New York is, 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 is not only keeping the recovery going, but having it spread to those areas that have been suffering, which is why I think the governor has been correct in having a economic development strategy with the regional economic development councils that is not focused on a one-size-fits-all. So you bring together business and community leadership in each of these regions, and they come up with projects that I think will be helpful. Now, we shouldn't be afraid of asking the question, all right, is it working as well as it should? Are, are some of these grant opportunities really the smartest use of money? I mean, that's where I think we shouldn't be so afraid to question. Not everything yep. should yep. be just a, you know, a ribbon cutting and a press release that's wonderful and then you don't, you don't get the jobs that were, were expected. But you know, I, I think the governor's on the right track with those councils. I think we need to do more, which is what we're doing, to evaluate the existing programs. The local efforts, like the industrial development agencies, yep. the IDAs, where yep. there's been a lot of 
abuse or lack of supervision or inconsistency, right. not getting the payback on jobs. And we, we do have now IDA reform legislation that just took effect this summer. We'll see if that works. So, but the focus to, to your question, Doug, is that we, we, especially for those of us who are downstate, and we may have our own quibbles about things not being where totally where we want them to be. We have to realize on a relative basis, we're doing really, oh. really strongly. And you go to, to so many of these towns as I travel the state, and they, and they still are struggling. And there's no silver bullet or nope. easy answer nope. on it, but we have to continue to be persistent. We have to recognize, I think the small business sector is, 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 is what we have to continue to have a focus and greater support. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I don't think you're going to get the big, big corporations to come no. in and solve all the problems. But, you know, they just got a, a nice contract in, in, in the southern tier on a, on a transportation contract. There, there are some bright spots there, but, but we cannot overlook the fact that uh, until we get the, the upstate economy and those regions of upstate moving again, you know, we, we can't say our task is done yeah. in economic development. Yep. Okay. And which is why we're going to do reports on it so we know where we stand. And uh, get the eye of the go. Oh, no. Talk about corporate uh, political spending, which yeah. has been one of your major yeah. Uh, efforts. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, you can have a philosophical debate about it, but uh, after Citizens United, the unleashing of corporate political spending is something that I think is very corrosive to our political system. That being said, my role in this uh, debate has been as an investor. We invest in corporations, shareholders, pension fund, got to keep the pension strong. I would like to know as an investor, how is your bottom line in terms of, of my investment doing well enhanced by your doing corporate political spending? What you do as an individual if you're a CEO, yep. if you have a, a company pack, that's separate. This is money that comes out of the corporation that you are spending uh, you know, for candidates, for trade associations, for lobbying. Uh, we'd like to know what spending, what, what is the spending disclosure? And, and even in, when Justice Kennedy, unfortunately, uh, was oh. in the majority opinion there, he yeah. said, well, it'll, it'll be disclosed. Are people be able to right. Well, it's not no. being disclosed. That's, that's the whole issue. So we've been pressing corporations with shareholder resolutions, with engagements. You know, we had a, a lawsuit against, against Qualcomm, oh. and, they, and they came around, fortunately. We want to know disclosure political spending. So we've had some more victories this year. Uh, Smuckers, a well-known corporate hey, name, they came along come and, on. uh, among, I think, about, about a half dozen victories now. So we had a I yeah, think had Harley, about, Harley, Harley. I think was one of them. I think we're up to about 34 companies yeah. that have responded to our request for disclosure of political spending. In some cases, maybe they'll decide not to do political spending, which I don't have a problem with. But at a minimum, let us know so we can evaluate how yep. it's helping the bottom line. From the, the shareholders. From a shareholder perspective. The problem is, you know, we're investing in thousands of companies. Yep. And other shareholders are doing similar, other investors, similar effort. You really need a more standard approach. I hope the SEC, and we've written to the SEC, we've joined with Scott String, and we've joined with other institutional investors, the SEC should set a standard to say corporations must disclose the spending. They haven't been willing to go that far yet, but we're going to keep pressing. Why aren't they? I mean, the well, obvious reasons that, uh, quote unquote, they're in the pocket of close quote. I'm not sure. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, Mary Jo White is terrific. Yeah. We know her from New York. I, I think they have a lot on their plate. Number one, number two, the SEC is, you know, has divided politics, and this Congress has been very hostile to the yes, SEC. Yes, yes. You know, so I don't think it's that, that they're in the pocket. I, think, I, I just think this is a battle they have chosen not to engage in. I, I would hope. Oh, that's what I meant. I meant met metaphorically. Oh, okay, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. that they yeah. were corrupt. Right, right, right. right okay. Right, right. Phew. I mean, suit. Oh, no. <laughs> State finances and the economy. How are we doing? The economy is showing some signs of, of, of slowing down. Um, taxes? Taxes are down lower than projected. I think for the coming year, we need to be a little more cautious. Uh, we projected some out-year budget gaps, you know, because we made some big spending commitments this year. You see the volatility in the stock market, up, down, up, down. That has consequences. Wall Street is not doing as well in terms of their profits. And we could rail about Wall Street. I always say whether you love them or hate them, their tax revenue helps pay for all these other programs oh, that we yeah. care about. So we have to strike that right balance, you know, as far as regulation. But we want New York to be the global capital for finance. But, you know, 2016 is, 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 is I think, a more, you know, problematic year. Uh, I think some of the uncertainty relates to the national elections until that's settled out, yep. you know. But I, I, my, I would say, you know, we need to be a little more cautious. I, I, we may be in a, in, a, in, a, in a tighter revenue picture going into next year. What does being more cautious entail? And from whom does it entail well, it'll caution? Start, it'll start with the governor's budget proposal. You know, I'm sure they're starting to crunch the numbers. Uh, after uh, early November, we, we put out the preliminary revenue estimates from our office from the legislature and the governor. 
and then heading into January, the executive budget proposal. And, and, and I think it, it might mean that, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, more generous allocations that we had certainly this year, uh, you, you may not see that. Okay, we have a minute to, to what final question. That's all? I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, you're fun. <laughs> Hillary Trump. Uh, I'm a big Hillary fan, always have been. Uh, I think that uh, the, the, the overriding issue of qualification, of temperament, of experience, of ability to do the job, she wins on all those counts, whatever ups and downs happen during the campaign, and we know there are some. That, those, uh, that reality doesn't change, and uh, I think she's going to be the next president of the United States. <laughs> Sounds like the company line. Well, but I believe that. I really do. I, I, you know, it, look, it's a very unpredictable. It's, it's an unpredictable year, yeah. right? I mean, that's pretty clear. So a lot of our conventional ways of an analyzing don't matter anymore. I don't know the polling matters as it did before. But I still have a basic confidence in, in, in who she is and what her message is, and, and, and I think she would. I think, I think it'll be a competitive race. Well, well wait a minute. Be, be, I mean, do you have confidence race. in the American people to discern the qualities of the candidates? Well, yes, I do. I mean, I, 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 I'm disappointed some years, there's no doubt about it, but I, I think everybody understands how high the stakes are in 2016. And I, I think whatever entertainment value there is, and there's been much entertainment this year, I think at some point people will wake up uh, on the morning of election day and say, oh, wait a minute, this is President of the United States. The world is dangerous. Right. A lot of people are out to get us. Right. Our economy is not where it needs right. to be. We have a lot of divisions in this country. Uh, we need someone who's not going to screw things up. Okay. I think Hillary, Clinton, I think Hillary Clinton will benefit from that. <laughs> My thanks to New York State Controller Thomas DiNapoli for being on the show and for, as usual, his insight, his grace, and his humor. Join me in two weeks with guests Ed Rollins, Hank Scheinkoff, and David Birdsell talking Hillary Trump and the first presidential debate. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>